My name is Vinka de Willem. I'm the chair of the Department of Architecture at Weizmann Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I would like to thank you tonight on this cold night to join us for this final lecture of our full series featuring Charles Renfro. I would also like to welcome Jean Cohn, James von Klemperer, and H. Clark from KPF, and of course, thank them for the generously sponsoring of tonight's event as they have been for so many years at this point. It allows us to add meaningful and world-renowned speakers to our lecture series, as well as enjoy their company and input. I look forward to speaking all to several of you, or actually all of you, hopefully, uh, immediately following this lecture. Now to our speaker. Very, very excited to have Charles Renfro with us. He was here three years ago, and um, in this three-year cycle of the academic life, brand new again uh, for Penn. Not so much for our faculty who know you very well. I know you very well, many, many years. And so it's also a very big favor and fun point to me. So thank you for joining us again. Um, yeah, and there's Fritz. Hi, Fritz. Um, Charles joined Dillard and Scofidio in 1997 and was promoted to partner, to partner at Diller & Scofidio Renfro in 2004. Charles has been a longtime friend, as I mentioned, and I'm super excited to welcome here at Weizmann. DSR is an interdisciplinary studio that fuses architecture, visual arts, and the performing arts while investigating issues of contemporary culture, such as the spatial conventions of every day, the influence of media technologies on architecture, and the changing definitions of domesticity and the institu institution of the public realm. Their most recent 2019 high profile project got much acclaim, including of course, the shed in New York City, the renovation and expansion of New York, New York's Museum of Modern Art, also in New York City, and the last remaining section of the High Line known as the Spur. Prior to joining DSR, Charles was an associate at Smith, Miller & Hawkinson Architects. I didn't know that. Were you with FEDA? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ralph Applebaum Associates. And he's a graduate of Rice University and holds a master's degree from Columbia University's GSAPP. He is currently a faculty member of the School of Visual Arts. But as a collaborator with Diller and Scofidio, Charles served as a project leader on the Brasserie, love that place, IBEAM, the BAM uh, Cultural District Master Plan with Rem Cola as Olme, the Blur, Boston Institute of Contemporary Art, and Zaradaya Park, a 35 acre park adjacent to the Kremlin in Moscow. Mm -hmm. He, he also led a number of academic projects at Stanford University, UC Berkeley, and Brown University, and is currently designing new facilities for Columbia, the University of Chicago, and the University of Toronto. He will be leading the renovation of the Dallas Calita Humphreys Theater, Frank Lloyd Wright's only built freestanding theater. That's going to be amazing. Yeah. Abroad, he is leading the design of the Museum of Image and Sound in Rio de Janeiro, the Tianjin Juilliard School ah, in China, and Adelaide Contemporary, a new gallery in Australia. I guess no traveling is over for you very soon. DSR was awarded the National Design Award in Architecture from the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum in 2006 and Renfro's work with DSR has been exhibited worldwide at many museums and institutions, including the Museum of Modern Art New York, the Whitney Museum, the Netherlands Architecture Institute, the Canadian Centre for Architecture, and the Centre Pompidou. Please join me in welcoming Charles Renfro. Hi, everyone. I can, I, can hear, I can hear the murmuring in the audience. Um, no, it's a, a good turnout. I can see 110. Um, it's wonderful to be here today, Winka. Great for you to invite me back. Um, you know, I always love um, speaking with your, your students and, um, you know, there's always a robust conversation at the end. And so we're going to leave a bit of time for that conversation at the end here. Um, and um, 
because I did uh, present a few years ago, um, I'm almost thinking of this talk as a, a kind of coda or part two of my talk um, then, which was entitled Democracy. Um, and the, the focus of our work um, is very much um, about um, public space in the city, and that can be manifested in man any number of uh, institutional forms, such as a museum or a performing arts center. Um, or a public park. Um, but moreover, I think almost all of our projects that touch the public realm um, try to engage the public in a different way, provocative way, um, and um, try to, to pull more out of the potential uh, than the client has actually, the potential of the program than the client is actually imbued in the program. So we're, we're really looking for problems uh, in the programs we get more than the, the the, office, the uh, institutions are that, that hand them to us. Uh, so we're sort of problem makers, we're troublemakers. Um, and, and we sort of pride ourselves on that. I'm gonna uh, start sharing my screen. And let's see, uh, I believe this is it. Um, and I'm going to do a, uh, let's see, presentation mode. Okay, um, so rather than give the introduction to our firm, um, it's giving a tour of, of previous work, uh, I think most of you know the, the work uh, around in the States. Um, Liz and Rick founded the firm uh, as, as um, defectors from the mainstream world of architecture. They um, were starting a practice in the, in the, late, eight, um, in the late 70s and early 80s and found that the commercialization that had infected uh, the American practice of architecture was, was, was not, had left, left all of the intellectual discussions on the sidelines. And um, so started working in um, performance, in dance, in art, um, and challenging the conventions of the, of the, the way that these uh, disciplines and media uh, present their work. And so there were a lot of spatial typographies that were challenged, uh, such as the, the space of the theater. Um, since, since the foundation of the firm in the early 80s, uh, we've grown to be 110 people and, um, and our work has grown in size and, and traversed the world. Um, and when I was at Penn three years ago, I, I started uh, to speak about Zariagia Park. Um, it was just starting construction when I spoke and it is now open. Uh, so Zariadja Park, you can see from the slide on the screen, is the last uh, quarter of central Moscow to have been built. And the other uh, quarter uh, was the Kremlin uh, right across the street. We won this uh, competition in an in a international um, competition, um, which included several Dutch uh, offices, by the way. Um, it was a very well-run competition uh, and that's why it was even um, more ironic that it would be won by an American team led by the gay uh, architect. Um, the site had been occupied by a 3000 room hotel, the Hotel Rosia, uh, was a state run hotel, of course. Um, and the, the rumors are that the basement levels of this hotel were in fact um, a, a bunker for the Kremlin or some other form of uh, intelligence operation. Uh, we actually were never allowed to see what was underneath the, the surface of the park. Uh, and, and in fact, our design was uh, about remaking uh, the surface and above. And our associate architects had to tell us where we couldn't, could and couldn't put foundations. Um, this is the, the competition drawing that uh, led to the win. Um, and it's a, it's a park, but it's also um, got a hundred and or 240,000 square feet of culture spaces embedded in the park surface. Our idea um, for the, the park was uh, something called wild urbanism. Um, we sought to bring native landscapes, um, archetypal landscapes from around Russia right to the heart of Moscow, including the birch forest, which um, uh, fills most of Siberia, um, right to Red Square. And you'll see how well we did on that, uh, that, that proposition. Um, so we chose four different typologies, the tundra, the forest, the wetland, and the steppe, 
um, each with its own archetypal planting and um, uh, flora and fauna uh, and surface. Um, we brought each of those four uh, landscape typologies to the park and arranged them uh, from highest to lowest uh, according to where they would sit naturally in the world, from high being the tundra to low being the wetland. Uh, the wetland borders the Moscow River. Um, and so the site has a natural, naturally occurring slope that we utilized in the design. Uh, each section of landscape was tugged to cover uh, portions of the subsequently lower landscape and making in the process moments where pro program could be embedded uh, into the site. Um, therefore, leaving the entire surface of Zariadia completely public and accessible and green. Uh, while um, allowing in, uh, as I said, 240,000 square feet of public program. Um, we were also conscious of the, the flora and fauna that, would, uh, that were naturally occurring in Moscow and around Moscow and sought to make an ecosystem that could self uh, support uh, and thrive into the future. We worked with Hargraves Associates, by the way, on this project, they were really fabulous. We were also interested in thinking about climate in, an, in, a, in a way that would make the park more usable for more people for more of the year. Uh, as you probably know, Moscow is a cold climate. It's uh, very uh, dark and gray in the winter, um, very, very cold and snowy. Um, and so we sought passive and active ways to change the ambient temperature of the park, starting with uh, the grid shell, the, the blue blob that you see on the right hand side of the screen, which would capture the sun's energy uh, underneath uh, this dome structure um, and allow that the, a hill underneath to be used throughout the year. It would also keep the grass green uh, and snow free. There were other um, elements of a, of a sustainable program uh, that uh, were mostly axed when the budget uh, got tightened, but we did manage to hold on to this grid shell system. And so uh, what happens is the park rolls over uh, the new Philharmonic Hall and is capped with a very large uh, grid glass grid shell structure that captures the heat in the winter and makes it um, uh, 10, 10 degrees uh, warmer uh, Celsius uh, in, the, in the winter months. Um, uh, the topography of the site is covered with, a, with an undulating, bifurcating, and completely um, uh, sort of seemingly random uh, pixelated paving pattern, taking clues from the High Line where we developed a paving system that allowed the grass to grow through the cracks of the, of the man-made surface. Here, we allowed these pixels in the shape of hexagons to meander freely uh, making the park almost entirely accessible uh, to everyone. Um, and this is a diagram of how those um, uh, hexagonal pixelated paving units uh, feathered into the landscape, allowing the landscape to, to overtake uh, the walkways at times. Um, the idea was that the park would be 100% accessible and open to the public 24-7. Uh, they had wanted to put a fence around the park and we convinced them not to. We convinced them not to put gates around the park. Um, and in so doing, this park has truly become uh, Moscow's uh, destination, park, you know, green destination in the center of Moscow. This was our competition view. And this is what the park looked like when it opened three years ago. Um, uh, it essentially, they realized all the parts and pieces of the park almost as we had drawn them in the competition. We worked with local architects and engineers to realize some of the more daring uh, efforts in the park, including uh, the river overlook, which is a cantilever of 75 meters in concrete that provides a new um, destination for sightseeing and uh, hanging out um, suspended over the Moscow River. And then here um, is the northwest corner of the site showing the birch forest having been um, exported from uh, its uh, native Siberia into the middle of Moscow, uh, where it inhabits the square, Red Square, immediately adjacent to St. Basil's Cathedral. Um, you can see some naturally occurring uh, topography that we enhanced by covering over um, the, the museum elements that are, that are hidden underneath. 
Um, this is an element of the tundra. We uh, literally took uh, boulders from the land, uh, the countryside around Moscow and brought them to the tops of the hills so that in the park, there are moments where you're com you completely lose the city around you, can't see anything. The foliage is so dense or the sectional shifts are so great. Um, and then there are other moments where you rise up onto these hilltops uh, to witness uh, the whole city coming in around you. Here's one of the moments where you completely lose yourself um, and the city is not visible. Um, you're amongst the birch trees. We intentionally left uh, a lot of the park unpaved um, and, and grasses um, able to be trounced and uh, mashed down um, in order to reflect um, the real usage of the park and to welcome everybody uh, into it equally. This is one of the moments where the landscape covers a subsequent layer of landscape. Uh, this is the entrance to a media pavilion with uh, lots of interactive um, uh, shows about the history of Moscow and this, the site itself. Uh, they will uh, be changing. And then this is the grid shell that I was speaking about, which captures the sun's heat during the, um, the cooler months and allows people to ascend up a fairly steep slope um, into a protected area, um, which also serves as a, a band uh, or a grandstand uh, that seats 5,000 people. One of the things um, about the brief was they were nervous about making a place where uh, large groups of people could congregate. Um, and we intentionally uh, defied that regulation and, and thought about uh, a place where we could gather lots of people. This is what it feels like under the shell. The shell actually has operable triangular skylights that can um, open during the summer months, therefore creating a natural um, uh, radiant cooling effect. It draws uh, the air in on the underside of the shell and makes a naturally ventilated uh, area of the park. Um, and what happens when you get to the very top of the hill underneath the shell is Moscow is revealed to you through a series of triangular panels with glass, um, uh, glass structural members that you can basically see through. Uh, and so Moscow is presented back to you after you've lost the city uh, traversing the site. Um, and just some anecdotal images um, in its first year of existence in 2018 at New Year's um, uh, in one of the first snows, you can see that the grass maintained its, its green luxuriousness. Um, the overlook uh, is a 75 meter cantilever made of concrete um, and uh, reinforced concrete designed by our local engineers. We had planned this overlook to be made of steel um, and we didn't think it was possible to actually make a cantilever that long. Uh, but um, the, our collaborators were fantastic and they uh, really try to realize all of the visions that we had for the park, including this cantilever. And um, uh, it has become one of Moscow's most uh, visited uh, destinations. And you can see why it gives you an interesting uh, vantage point that wasn't available to anyone before. We wanted to make sure that this park reflected a kind of contemporary language of uh, landscape and architecture merging into one. Um, but that it also um, demonstrated uh, a kind of um, uh, kind of intent to make a new, new destinations and icons in the city of Moscow. And rather than go vertically to compete with Stalin skyscrapers or the domes, the, the, the gold domes that surround the site, we chose to make a horizontal monument um, that has also become an icon, as you'll see in a second. Um, and provides a perfect place for selfies. Um, as, uh, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of this is taking place on the Overlook now. Um, and it's a place that people have been, uh, been going to year round, uh, even in the dead of winter, um, it remains a great uh, spot for congregating and seeing the city in a new way. Here's the river frozen over with people still on the Overlook. And then um, something that we're very excited about that happened sort of naturally, and it happened on the High Line too, is that people have just started taking it over to, to do what they want to do. Um, uh, it's, it's received millions and millions of visitors, um, including at the World Cup, 
uh, thousands of people gathered on the grandstand um, in kind of defiance of, um, you know, the, the wishes of uh, the federal government. Um, and it made it on the world's greatest places 2018 uh, of Time Magazine. We're very proud of that. But it's also made it into the register of most, most romantic places uh, in Moscow. Um, and in fact, started making some news, um, not after weddings were held, but after um, people were discovered to be having sex in the bushes. And to me, um, there's nothing better than making a park that um, facilitates um, amorous connection. Uh, that's a better than any kind of critical regard you could get. Here's our premiere um, at the opening. And uh, we can talk about that later if you want. Um, and the, the, we also know that we've succeeded um, in making a new monument in that it showed up on a postage stamp uh, almost immediately. So um, I'm gonna do a quick run through the highline. I'm sure you all know it, but it leads uh, into uh, the shed project, which I'm going to linger on for a minute. Um, highline is a 1.5 mile stretch of elevated um, railway that was abandoned in the early eighties. Uh, the highline was um, an important thoroughfare for delivering food products to Manhattan. And as such, it had many spurs and offshoots and loading docks that allowed freight cars to, um, to be emptied into the warehouses uh, where food was processed and distributed. It was uh, called the Lifeline, uh, actually, when it was first made. Um, unfortunately, um, the interstate trucking system, uh, well, not unfortunately, what happened was the interstate system was, was made after World War II really not long after the High Line was, was built. And it uh, made the High Line pretty obsolete because inter interstate trucking took most of, um, most of that business away. And so there was a lot of controversy around its, um, its conversion into a park. Most people wanted to take it down, especially our former mayor, Rudolph Giuliani, um, who thought that it was unsightly and it was a, it was a ter terrible for development that it, it hindered development of the West Side um, and that it was unsightly and dangerous. Um, uh, just to show you about a little bit about the state of the line when we, we found it um, or we, we started working on it, um, it had naturally evolved into a kind of green space that, that recovered and renewed itself every spring season um, with, uh, this is, this was done in the fall. So that's why the plants are gray or uh, brown, but, um, uh, seedlings had taken root, um, in the dirt and air mixture of, of the ballot found in the ballast, um, and became a kind of de facto green space in New York. And those of us that were in New York in the neck, in the, in the nineties, early nineties or late eighties before the line was, was rehabilitated. Um, almost all broke in through buildings and went up here and knew the potential of this uh, space to, um, to be uh, a new kind of public space in New York, uh, one that, that uh, was unlike any other. And so we were very keen on saving the tracks and converting them into a new public space 30 feet in the air. We were also excited by the fact that this line threads its way through or threaded its way through New York's, some of New York's most colorful neighborhoods, including uh, the Meatpacking District, um, where there were um, street walkers and there, were, um, there was meat of every sort um, that, that occupied the streets of the Meatpacking District. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that this, this park acknowledged that history of New York City. We also wanted to make sure that it acknowledged the physical history of the line itself and that um, we, we would um, make the park uh, sort of make, be made out of the ingredients of the line that were already there, including the, the, the concrete, which was allowing green to go through the, grow through the cracks. So we came up with a paving um, unit, a long tapered uh, precast concrete unit uh, that allowed um, the planting to grow through the cracks in the pavers and let us make uh, pathways that meandered, uh, that were not uh, well formed on the edges or straight lines, but actually um, zigzagged back and forth and even bifurcated to make um, more private and intimate areas on the line. 
And this is uh, all given uh, that the line is at times only 20 feet wide. Uh, we, like is our idea, we were conscious of the flora and fauna, uh, the kind of relationship between those, uh, those two elements of the line and sought to, to make the line a kind of habitation spot for birds and migratory patterns, um, et cetera. But we also were thinking about other sorts of uh, users um, in, in addition to the birds, uh, meaning those people that uh, inhabited Manhattan and would maybe use this park differently than they would use any other kind of park. Moreover, we didn't want this park to be a place simply of recreation, um, but a place of urbanity uh, and a place of meeting, a social place and a place of seeing. So the result is um, what you know now um, or now know um, that now uh, completes itself around Hudson Yards. Um, it has grown, grown in very nicely. Um, it has over 7 million visitors uh, a year, uh, which makes it among New York City's most touristed destinations. Um, the planting was all selected by virtue of having either been there uh, when it was discovered as a ruin or being brought in to be self-sufficient um, uh, in, in the environment of New York City. One of the other amazing things about the line is it passes through between and against buildings making naturally occurring climate changes that sponsor different kinds of planting, including very tall trees um, in certain sections that are wind protected. Um, the, the foliage has gotten quite large in certain places, arching over the line, completely eclipsing uh, the views of the city uh, around it. Um, or in other places, we intentionally um, uh, altered the existing structure of the line in order to see the city uh, better. Um, and, and in fact, um, oh my goodness, I didn't put my stop clock on. Okay, well, I know when we started. Um, the, the, um, the, the 10th Avenue overlook was a widened area of steel structure uh, that we uh, chose to alter in order to make a kind of grandstand uh, with a view portal down 10th Avenue. And um, this grandstand uh, was essentially um, looked at a stage full of sort of nothingness except traffic. Um, but we were very interested in the quotidian operations of the city and, uh, and, and, and seeing the city differently using this line which weaves its way through as a protagonist in forming new kinds of stories about New York City. Um, again, uh, it's been taken over by all sorts of, of users. Um, I'm gonna check this video out, I can't remember what this is. Oh, okay, this is, this is 10th Avenue Overlook um, where you, you see nothing but car tail lights going northbound on 10th Avenue. Um, and you would think that's, that would be the most boring thing to do. And yet, um, people hang out here uh, all day and, and all night until it closes. Uh, during the warm months. Um, and contrary to um, the prognosticators that claimed that the High Line was terrible for development uh, and a, a hindrance to, to get reaching the water, in fact, quite the opposite happened, as you probably all know. Um, the line has been um, uh, drawn and, and written about and featured in TVs, TV series, and I believe movies. Um, it has become quite uh, well known around the world um, and uh, has been bottled as a fragrance and um, as a, a pot <laughs> um, and has been copied in, um, in over 50 cities uh, around the world uh, and, and more. Um, and it's an important thing to note that the Rails to Trails movement uh, was not started with the High Line uh, and it continues unabated, mostly because of uh, trucking and other ways that, that goods are distributed in the city. Rail lines that used to penetrate our central cities uh, have been more and more abandoned. Um, and those lines have, have been thought to, or, or have been looked uh, at to link uh, disparate parts of the city together and to provide continuous green spaces that are accessible to um, less fortunate people in urban districts 
that are usually away from parks because rail lines used to go through uh, the industrial parts of the cities. So it's actually a win-win to turn these spaces into parks and give them back to the city. And the city has adopted the High Line in, in numerous ways. Uh, the first summer we opened, a cabaret singer would come out to her balcony every uh, evening at 9 p.m. and serenade passersby on the line. Um, and this is kind of famous uh, moment uh, when after the standard opened, uh, and there was a kind of symbiotic relationship between the line and the hotel. It was even rumored that the owner of the hotel had encouraged his employees to uh, go to the windows and um, and put on performances uh, that would um, attract attention to the to the hotel. Um, we kind of liked this and we're intrigued uh, by the, the naturally occurring relationships that were happening um, between the city and the High Line uh, Park. And um, in fact, uh, two years ago, after the line uh, opened, it had been open for eight years, we put on uh, what, what is called the Mile Long Opera. And that opera was essentially based on um, stories uh, about the neighborhood uh, and about its transformation uh, from uh, an old uh, grimy industrial uh, neighborhood into a kind of, you know, urbane and expensive neighborhood. Um, the opera itself uh, was um, uh, something that a spectator could take at his or her own pace uh, and encounter uh, one of a thousand singers along the way. You could encounter all of them if you wanted um, on a, uh, a score uh, that was sung a cappella with no uh, musical accompaniment all on the same note, around the same note, uh, but with different songs weaving together uh, this saga of the west side of Manhattan. Uh, the Thousand Singers were composed by uh, choirs from around the city, both amateur and professional, church choirs, school choirs, kids, uh, adults, senior citizens. Uh, the entire makeup of New York City was represented by the folks that sang in the opera. Um, uh, recently, there's been a lot of discussion about reprising the opera uh, since it might actually be a COVID safe production since you can distance properly. Um, it was quite a spectacle uh, and uh, a little jarring to be at a performance where you're this close to the performers um, hearing their actual words coming out of their mouth and then stringing together the songs which they were singing partly together sometimes and partly independently from one another. It's quite magical. Um, and then of course, um, we all know about the burgeoning real estate uh, developments uh, around the High Line. This, this map was done a few years ago. It's, it's so much more than this at this point, uh, but billions of dollars of investment. Um, and uh, I'm sure that Giuliani was sad that he did not invest in projects over here um, and lots of new jobs. Um, et cetera. And of course, as I said, it's one of the um, most attended um, uh, in New York City tourist destinations. There's issues though. Um, and you know, something that we had to contend with uh, is, is the development uh, itself making the property values so increased um, that it forced businesses that had long served uh, some uh, two housing projects that the line goes through to shutter um, and thus leaving some of the local residents that had been there for decades uh, out in the cold. So the gentrification that the line caused has been uh, cause for a lot of thinking about how to uh, insert new urban projects into delicate neighborhoods and, and what safeguards we can do to, to uh, to prop up the neighborhoods uh, with the successes of these projects. The line leads up to um, Hudson Yards uh, at its north end. On 30th Street, it takes a bend to the, to the west towards the river. Um, and what was a grimy sort of um, alternative past has become entirely uh, sort of developed um, and commercialized uh, at, uh, in its current condition. Um, so the Hudson Yards was built on the tracks that were owned by the, the MTA um, that auctioned that the building rights off uh, to uh, developers that competed for those building rights, related one. 
And as part of the deal with the city, uh, the city required the related set aside a parcel of property to be fully owned by the city of New York uh, to house um, a new kind of cultural institution. And they issued an RFP uh, to the general public, to the design professional public, I should say, um, asking people to think about what the future of New York City culture would look like and what kind of building would we need to house that. And so we won the competition. Uh, the land is that, that red spot on the left-hand side. Um, this was the RFP that we um, proposed uh, you know, uh, 12 years ago. It's been a long, a long haul to get the shed off the ground uh, or rolling, I should say, to get the shed rolling. Um, and I mean, I guess it started uh, with us asking the question, why would there need to be another cultural institution in New York City, City at all? Why should there be one more? And we started thinking about, um, first off, the merger of, of art forms into uh, sort of non, uh, multidisciplinary, non-media um, specific work um, that includes time-based work, um, you know, traditional artwork, but also video and film and music, um, and realized that there was no institution and no institutional space that was specifically geared to show all of these different kinds of, of, uh, of art in one place. And so we thought, well, wouldn't it be great if we could make a space that finally could be transformed to accommodate all of these different forms of culture and art making um, with ease? So um, with that, um, and the inspiration that comes from Cedric Price's Fun Palace, as you probably know, this was a 60s project uh, that was proposed for London and never realized uh, whereby the users, it was a cultural facility also, but it acknowledged that life and culture had all but merged um, and that it was hard to distinguish between an actual culture product and the, and the idea of living one's life. And that a, a culture um, building for the future should simply be a piece of infrastructure that allows for the users, um, in the case of the shed, that would be the curators and the, uh, the artists to remake uh, the shed to best accommodate um, whatever it is they're trying to put on. Uh, you may recall that um, the Rogers and Piano uh, entry for the Pompidou uh, looked like this. Um, it was a little bit later than the Fun Palace, but in essence, it was tapping into the zeitgeist of the moment, which suggested that uh, new culture inst institutions operate as pieces of infrastructure, of urban infrastructure, and weave themselves into the city and be transformable uh, to accommodate whatever uh, needs might arise from tiny scale to giant scale to spectacle to intimate. And our inspiration came from our, our site, which is a former industrial site and uh, the site of the railroad and the High Line, which is in green there. And we looked at really simple mechanisms that would allow for a building to, to move itself, to change its space, to grow both in plan, but also in section. Um, and uh, the idea uh, was that the building was sited on that little tiny green patch, um, but that it had a public park, uh, or let's say a privately owned public space uh, around it that would be essentially given over to New York City as a public park. And that we knew that we wanted to occasionally occupy a portion of that park. We wanted to make something that had a light touch and could be retracted and the park could be given back over to the public. So we came up with this, um, this, this gantry crane technology, uh, which would roll a big shed, 125 foot cube, um, over a fixed building that contains four cultural floors. It also could be transformed in, in a number of ways. Um, and when it rolls out from over that fixed building, it would make a space of spectacle that could be used to do any number of things. And so the shed, uh, as we proposed it, um, and uh, there it is in, in our proposal phase, you'll see some finished pictures, it's completed um, and open, and I hope some of you have been, um, but it is a rather complex building in the end with a very simple expression. Uh, nine of its floors are embedded in the, the, the lower levels of the adjacent um, uh, condo um, and rental residential building that we also designed. Um, and uh, this is the shed under construction. Um, 
the entire uh, shed structure is conceived to be a kind of theatrical uh, rig on wheels. It's the height of an opera house fly tower, um, but it's also the size of an entire opera house. So what can happen is uh, that all the rigging and technical equipment that you would normally associate with um, a production in a theater of the fly tower can actually happen in the same space in which the audience sits. So it really blurs the line between the spectacle and the spectator, um, the performer and the audience, um, et cetera. Um, and then one more little video here, just to show some of the, way, the ways it can transform. Uh, that's the high line as it reaches 200 yards. Um, and then our site, fully owned by the city of New York, uh, not owned by related, uh, is the side of the shed. Um, and it's a very simple loft building with four floors of culture space. Uh, and uh, top, the top floor can also be used as an event space covered by a steel diagrid shell uh, that wraps uh, over the top of that building with enough depth to house all of its own mechanical systems and all the theatrical rigging that allows it to operate as an independent theater um, with only tethers to the fixed building. The grid shell is covered in ETFE pillows, which uh, offer um, sound and thermal um, in insulation. Uh, between the outside world and the inside of the shed itself. Um, one can drive a truck right onto the surface of the, the shed, uh, the McCourt Theater as it's called, the large space, um, and loading can happen right there on the spot. Um, several of the glass doors to the fixed building open and allow for um, expansion of the uh, horizontal area or deliveries to take place right from the surface of the shed. The third floor um, is expressly thought to be a theater space that can be changed into one or several uh, smaller theater, one large or several smaller theaters. Um, what, you're what you just saw is the side walls guillotine down glass walls that allow the shed to essentially operate as an indoor outdoor pavilion. Um, uh, a theatrical grid um, descends down uh, to allow for intimate performances in the shed itself. These are acoustical banners and blackout shades that allow for amplified performance and film to be shown in the court. Um, you can do a traditional black box uh, surround setting or uh, something um, uh, more resembling a, um, well, this is a fashion show, but a proscenium type of stage where you can see 1200 people. Anyway, you get the idea. It's completely transformable. And um, moving on, these are photos of the shed under construction. That was the, the day that we uh, all gathered to watch it roll for the first time. Um, and then the shed uh, as a completed um, uh, element uh, in New York City, the ETFE uh, with just slight transparency. It's not fully transparent. There's just enough to get a hint of what's going on on the inside. Uh, the guillotine glass wall shown down in that rendition. And then the programming by the director, Alex Poots, who, who changed the nature of the institution to go from being um, mostly a presenter to actually um, a developer. So they actually make the work that is shown in the shed, citing the kind of opportunities of the building itself that, um, you know, wouldn't, uh, pieces wouldn't be made in other in, for other institutions that could fully take advantage of what the shed has to offer. Um, and so his program has been intentionally collaborative. Um, here it's between uh, Gerhard Richter and Steve Reich. Uh, these are two artists that were put together to make a collaborative piece, which was both physical and time-based. So essentially ushering in a new type of uh, performance um, or artistic production. Um, this is the setup for the, the very first concert that was held called Soundtrack for America. Um, and we're up on the third floor looking down. Um, you can see uh, the setup taking place um, in the blacked out McCourt Theater. Um, and then what that looked like uh, upon uh, the first performance um, with people up in the second level, uh, the glass door open, um, sort of joining that space into the space of the McCourt. 
And then what's really exciting about the space, and I've seen this a couple of times since it's been used, is that as a member of the audience, you're literally sitting under and with uh, the performers who could be moving up in space and floating above you uh, with a kind of inf a feeling of infinite regression. This is something that you would only have gotten on a stage uh, with a fly tower in any other kind of institution. Um, so anyway, it opened along with Hudson Yards, and you know, uh, Hudson Yards is is an interesting um, you know issue, um, and I think it's probably going to be re rethought a little bit in the way that it deals with the city. Um, the shed uh, has also been thinking about how to be a better neighbor, and has included. Uh, arts programs that are for the neighborhood uh, kids. Some of the people I was referring to in the High Line uh, that train them um, and also that give artists that have been underrepresented chances to show there. Um, and of course, like any um, piece of architecture got, got a nickname um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's the shawarma and the handbag together collectively. Um, now I'm gonna move uptown a little bit um, to the Museum of Modern Art. Um, when the museum was made, um, and, and just, I guess, let me finish with the shed, just to say that we think of that, uh, the shed as a kind of a public actor, um, a, a, a kind of piece of infrastructure that allows art to be shown, but it also allows the city to come in. The big giant guillotine doors that allow for anybody to pass through the space um, is really important. Um, way to reconceive of an, of, a, of an art institution, which is uh, in essence open. Um, MoMA also, um, uh, we, we have a lot of thought to the way that uh, MoMA would be re rethought uh, towards openness and transparency and accessibility. Uh, when it was originally made uh, by Goodwin and Stone, um, it was in a, a, a set of townhouses, ornate townhouses, and it really looked modern by dis distinction. To its, uh, to its context. Um, it had a great, you know, uh, kind of famous curtain wall um, and a, a member's lounge on the top floor that was open air and quite beautiful. And over the years, of course, um, it's been, it's a kind of a Frankenstein building. It's, it's grown um, since its inception uh, in 39, uh, subsequently, subsequent additions almost every 20 years. Um, have have made the museum become a mega museum, um, and you know, in in the intervening years, the neighborhood has lost its character of a kind of residential townhouse uh, neighborhood to become uh, New York's central business district. Um, there are many architects involved uh, in in the project, um, but one of the things that um, seems to have been lost uh, from the very first building was this idea of kind of domesticity. I was really excited to, to find these pictures and see house plants in the galleries of MoMA. Um, and uh, I also love looking at this lighting from the original building and thinking about the drama uh, that it made, but also the kind of intimacy uh, that you're not in this pool of, uh, of, of uh, bright light, you're actually focused on the art. The original MoMA therefore was really thought to be about about the art itself. And, and, and a lot of that had been lost over the years. I also remember that um, uh, the, the galleries, when I first moved to New York in the late eighties were covered in wall to wall carpet. Uh, and so the sound in the galleries was different. It was hushed. It was uh, very, it was much more intimate. And what had happened over the years is uh, that what you might recognize from pre um, uh, renovation, giant crowds, stuffed gallery spaces, obscured views, uh, commercial ground, a commercial ground floor that, that sort of prevented you from even understanding this as a place where you could access art. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, but when you looked at the lobby, when it was empty, you realized it was actually this wonderful connector between two streets. Um, and but when you get up in the galleries, uh, throngs of people around the highlights uh, taking selfies, et cetera. So it was clear that the, the museum um, was a, a victim of its own popularity and needed to expand to, um, to, to, to meet all the demands of the increased, um, uh, the increased crowds. It also had lost touch with its roots in a way. So what you're seeing here is a 
uh, view of 53rd Street and all the white elements um, are indications of where all of the uh, views were, have been taken away where there's no connection to the outside world. So despite the fact that it was essentially um, a glass and uh, steel modern building which promised views from outside the galleries, uh, from inside the galleries to the streets, it actually has had lost touch um, with that promise. And so this is a set of aspirations that we brought to the project, um, expand the shows uh, and uh, to, show it, to show the collection in new ways, uh, create a better interface with the city, bring art closer to the street, uh, also without tickets, um, and uh, give more agency to the visitors so that they can make their own route, um, and also tap into some of um, MoMA's original aspirations, which did have to do with making a, a very clean and transparent building. Um, so, you know, before we got into the to the job, um, MoMA had already decided to take down the Folk Art Museum, which was uh, on property that it purchased. Uh, and it was the only thing, uh, the only property that where it could expand. Um, we did try to find ways to work within the Folk Art Museum and uh, came up with several clever uh, potential routes to go, but in the end, MoMA decided that they didn't offer the kind of flexibility they wanted to support some of those ambitions that you saw in the last slide, which is to show art in a different way than, than MoMA had been showing it, um, and uh, to make to bring different kinds of art to directly to the galleries. This is a really uh, complex drawing; it's impossible to understand. But what it what it shows is that. Um, we added onto the galleries, but we actually also made uh, the loop uh, through the galleries, the existing three levels of galleries, uh, the second, uh, uh, fourth, and fifth floors, um, more easy to navigate. Um, and this is a kind of a sectional elevation of 53rd Street, showing uh, one of our biggest coups uh, that we achieved, which was that we convinced MoMA to let us sink the 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 uh, bookstore uh, into the basement level, but open essentially a horizontal window that you could look down into from 53rd Street, thus not losing its kind of window appeal, but not clogging your views into the museum uh, with, with the commercial goods. Um, and we convinced MoMA to allow the entire first floor to be ticket free. Uh, we made a, a stack of galleries that all have varying degrees of transparent windows uh, that both allow people to see out from the galleries, but also let um, passers-by um, see in to the galleries. We made a new kind of space for MoMA called the Studio Theater, which um, is actually on the gallery circuit, and you'll see some pictures of that in a minute. Um, the Studio Theater is here. It's only 110 seats, uh, but the the seating can be taken away completely. And this room, which is kind of like a black box, could simply be yet another gallery uh, on the circuit of galleries with a window to the street. Uh, another another um, uh, thing that we did is we made a set of split level galleries that look down onto one another, thus tying different circuits of uh, seeing art to other circuits in, in the museum. One of the problems that we found was it was really hard to understand the totality of the building and the collection. We added a new entry canopy, a knife blade that sticks out over 53rd Street and, uh, and pulls into a new double height entry space. Here's the new bookstore uh, uh, facade, um, which has absolutely no obstruction to seeing into the museum. There's a wall of art that you look into here. Um, and the bookstore is actually pl plainly visible from uh, what I call a horizontal window uh, from the sidewalk of 53rd Street. We added lots of uh, spaces to, to pause and reflect and, and, um, and uh, congregate uh, and have discussions. Uh, these are things that, that weren't in MoMA uh, before. And it was interesting to work um, in a building that had, has such tremendous history uh, and great bones to work with, many of which had been obscured. <clears throat> the Bauhaus stair was an original feature that, that probably the most important architectural feature of the Goodwin Stone building. Um, and we extended it one level to the ground floor, thus allowing for the, uh, everyone to flow uh, in two places up a, up a central staircase 
Um, and we took clues from the original building, including the terrazzo floor uh, and the glass rail, but we updated them for the 21st century. You can see that the stair here is on a cantilevered steel plate uh, with the terrazzo treads uh, holding um, in, in, a, in, in, the, in the riser, in the nosings, uh, the, the glass rail, which is cantilevered from the treads themselves. We, we tried to discover the material palette of the original Goodwin stone building that had long been covered up. It included a very figured, a figured marble uh, that we found in historic photographs that we tried to bring back uh, in a more cool palette, this black and white palette, um, which we then uh, feathered uh, throughout the museum, this, this particular stone. And we also brought um, uh, areas of wood uh, and intimacy. This is the ticket lobby, which is an elevated uh, moment uh, th that is calming. This is a completely acoustically controlled moment in the museum uh, with micro perforated wood. Um, and sometimes you don't know why it feels better, but, um, but you sense that something is calming uh, about the space. And it is that we change the acoustical uh, dimensions of the galleries. Um, this is sort of in, in response to what I said before, which is that the building had had um, carpet and, and other things that absorb sound and make it made it feel much more intimate. We also threaded a brand new stair, which is visible from 53rd Street uh, out of um, uh, stainless steel and glass. Uh, finally, there's one place where you could circulate from uh, top to bottom in the, in the museum sort of know where you are. And so as you pass through the art circuit, there you always encounter this light-filled breather space as a place of orientation. We were also interested in, in pushing the legacy of material exploration that uh, is embedded within the modernist project. And here, uh, very, very thin steel stairs, again, cantilevered from a blade, which in itself is hung from the sixth floor and has no, has no, no columns, no connections down below, um, uh, actually suspends the glass uh, very much like what we did in the Bauhaus stair. And then the stair itself is pushed right up to a new uh, uh, six story high glass curtain wall. Here's one of the moments where there's a sectional shift allowing one gallery to overlook the other gallery uh, and therefore pulling all the parts and pieces of the of the building and collection together. And this is the studio museum, which is always intended to be um, function either as an art, a space for art, uh, almost like a gallery or as a theater space. And, um, and so while there was a lot of consternation about the expansion, um, the the reviews have been pr pretty generous to, to MoMA and it has reopened and I encourage everyone to go. I'm gonna to finish today's talk with a project that um, has, has just, just opened literally uh, a week ago and in the midst of COVID, and this is the Tianjin Juilliard School um, in Tianjin, China. Tianjin is a, uh, in, the, in the metroplex of Beijing, it's the port city for Beijing, uh, a growing city uh, it was also considered a ghost city um, a few years ago. Uh, it was master planned by SOM and a lot of it was built, but it never received the kind of occupancy that uh, it was intended. And so the Juilliard School is put on the banks of the Haiho River uh, and uh, is intended to be a kind of a nucleus for activity in this entire district. Um, it's a very large uh, program, uh, 365,000 square feet with three uh, major performance halls, a black box theater, a recital hall, and a concert hall, and several smaller public uh, and, and, uh, uh, and private uh, rehearsal spaces. All of those halls sink into the ground, their basement levels linked underneath, uh, so the, the, the back of house spaces are underneath a public space, which is essentially an extension of the park that allows people, people to throw, flow through a lobby in between these, these performance spaces. The performance spaces are sculpted into uh, uh, what we call little nuggets, um, sort of chamfered and, and, uh, and carved to reflect the plans of the, of the spaces within, uh, but also to feel like uh, naturalistic uh, stone uh, uh, boulders uh, between which are, are held uh, five bars uh, containing all of the uh, teaching 
and uh, practice room. So all of the academic program sits in the five bars that span between these four um, uh, pavilions. Uh, so the interior space is column free, uh, open to the public. Uh, this is what it starts to look like. Um, the lobby is uh, also slightly a defense against um, the, the ravages of the pollution in China, which is quite bad, and also uh, provides a kind of year round destination for the district. You can see the bars uh, have where the uh, practice rooms exist. So up in right in above us are a set, set of practice rooms for a single people or, or, or chamber music. So every person that comes into the lobby witnesses the work uh, of, that's happening in the school and even hears a little bit of the sound of music education happening as it walks through the lobby. The entrances to each of the uh, performance spaces is carved away uh, with uh, sycamore uh, wood. Um, these are the bridges. Uh, there are four big skylights that are all engineered to open to let natural air go out um, and uh, collect uh, the people underneath their, their sunny uh, there's sunny spaces uh, where there are also trees and other types of landscape elements. The concert hall seats 800 people and has a direct connection to the park outside um, and the Hi-Ho River that can be, of course, shut down. Um, the recital hall is smaller, it seats 500 people um, and also has a, um, a beautiful slot window to the, to the landscape beyond. And a major performance, uh, a rehearsal hall on the top of the building uh, opens onto an outdoor deck uh, that is uh, open to the public uh, via a big stair. This is the, the view of the building from the river. Um, and we just open, um, uh, we just open, I don't know if the, oh, the video isn't here. Well, you know what, I probably can't show the video anyway because um, it's, <laughs> we're embargoing it. But um, needless to say, uh, we were very impressed by the Chinese that they were able to um, to, to finish this project um, during COVID, uh, sort of with us maintaining uh, a, an oversight uh, via Zoom and, and video walkthroughs. It was really challenging. It started almost immediately in January when Wuhan closed. Uh, I was actually there when the virus uh, was announced. <laughs> I was there the day it was announced. And my project managers and I all looked at each other and we said, huh, I wonder if that's going to change things. Um, at any rate, I'm going to um, close uh, the conversation and open the conversation. Um, and uh, I'm going to stop sharing and we'll rejoin the Zoom.